Good afternoon to returning from China. My name is Alessio Petino. I am the knowledge coordinator of the USME Center in Beijing. It's a pleasure to be here to welcome you to this webinar. Um, topic today is cybersecurity and data security. Um, obviously, it's, it's a very important topic uh, that does not affect only companies in China, but also all companies not necessarily in China, but doing business with China. As we all know, last year there were two major laws issued in China, and as well as um, many, many department rules are also in the process of being formulated. Uh, however, there still is a lot of uh, uncertainty, a lot of doubts, a lot of questions about um, specific uh, aspects of this data cybersecurity compliance. That's why today we decided to do this webinar. We invited two experts in the field to try to provide some clarity about these issues. Um, so um, this is going to be a bit interactive today. Um, First of all, we have collected before this webinar, we have collected already a series of questions from relevant um, uh, companies, uh, interested actors about uh, aspects that want to be covered. And we're going to respond to these questions during the webinar. At the same time, um, we invite all the participants to to um, submit, um, to, to, to intervene at any time uh, by raising your hand. Uh, we would like to have a direct um, contribution from your side, so raising hand, and we will give the floor to you. Um, also, Valentino and Simone, the two speakers, are going to, to, to make this webinar pretty interactive, so it's not going to be a lecture, uh, uh, like a non-interactive uh, kind of um, event. So before starting, I would like to spend a few words about uh, us, the USME Center. The USME Center uh, is actually a project funded by the European Commission uh, since 2010. Um, our mission is to help European small and medium enterprises to get ready to do business to China, with China, to get to know China, to know uh, what are the issues, what are the challenges and the opportunities. Um, we um, are implemented by a consortium of five chambers of commerce and business organizations, among which the Italian chamber is, is the lead. Um, we are actually approaching the end of our project phase, but there will be a new phase to follow uh, in the second half of the year for, for the next few years. So we will be around for, for, for still a few years. You can count on us. We partner up with many organizations, both from government and agencies, and we have a physical office in Beijing, which is where I am now. Um, very briefly, we provide four main types of services. The first, the first one is what we call knowledge center, basically, we, we write reports, case studies, guidelines on, on different um, aspects of, um, of, of different sectors, different aspects of doing business with China. This is a screenshot from a report. You can access all these publications from, from the bottom here, still called in red. Uh, second, we have this advice center, basically a sort of help desk that companies can use to ask any questions, including technical questions, uh, like, uh, like today, for instance, on data uh, compliance, uh, data transfer, but also on other aspects on all, all the sectors. We have experts ready to answer these uh, questions um, free of charge. Um, then we have, uh, yeah, we also have database of frequently asked questions and so on. Um, then we have a training center, basically what we're doing today, um, uh, training webinars on, on different uh, aspects. Uh, and, and actually everything we have done in the past, we used to record them, including by the way, today's webinar is going to be recorded um, and uploaded to our YouTube channel. You can see you can see everything we have done in the past months on our YouTube channel, including other uh, relevant um, events, like there's one here on software. Um, and then last, we have an advocacy platform through which um, we have a working group together with the European Chamber. We try to uh, do meetings on new policies. We write position paper together on different issues affecting SMEs. And, and this is open to everybody um, free of charge. You don't need to uh, be any member of anything. So you're welcome to join. Um, an overview of um, a few upcoming events. Actually, tomorrow there is going to be an, a very interesting one about commercial disputes, um, um, and then and then there will be other on different on different um, sectors. Uh, among which I would like to emphasize this one on the 10th of June, which is the final conference of our project. And basically, we will um, invite uh, some representatives from the institutions and. And we will also present some of the key highlights of our project phase in terms of results and achievements. 
um, all of all these events are free and you can find more details on our website, including for registration. So now uh, I would like to give the floor to Vincenzo Raffa for a brief introduction on the Italian Chamber. Ciao Alessio, thank you, thank you uh, uh, to you and uh, to the USMI Center. Uh, this is Vincenzo Rafa from the uh, China Italian Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I just want to uh, very briefly um, brief you on who we are, who is the Italian Chamber. Uh, the CSC is the uh, only uh, business organization that is recognized by both the Italian and the Chinese government. Of course, the Italian government, Ministry of Economic uh, Development, the MISE, and the um, uh, Chinese Ministry of uh, Civil Affairs, the MOCA. Uh, our aim is to, uh, to boost the internationalization of Italian business uh, to promote the Made in Italy uh, in, uh, in the PRC. Uh, the CSCC was founded in 1991. Uh, as you can see in this slide, uh, currently we have uh, seven offices nationwide uh, with Beijing, Shanghai and Guangzhou uh, the, the, with the most important uh, being the most important cities. Uh, each territory uh, we are a, in each territory we are a central partner of the so-called Italian system following the embassy and local consulates uh, as well as other partners. Uh, our chamber ranks uh, 11th uh, among all Italian chambers worldwide uh, for a number of, of uh, memberships. Uh, um, Last year, we closed the 2021 with over 830 members uh, representing Italian business community, such as public invested uh, in multinational corporations, small and medium enterprises and uh, service companies. Uh, our chamber is based on um, uh, industry based uh, working groups, uh, which with industry peer focusing on shared topics and looking for common solutions. Uh, you can see here all the 12 working groups currently activated in the in the chamber. And for this seminar, I would like to extend my thanks to the intellectual property working group, uh, IP working group the, of the Italian chamber. Uh, the CCC uh, offers a variety of services to uh, SMEs and uh, corporations, such as business contacts, uh, business and market analysis, uh, media and communication consultancy for all the local market uh, and consultancy service overall for companies that are interested in the Chinese market. As you can see here, we have information services, uh, events and communication, consultancy service and business contact. contact. Um, please uh, visit us. Uh, the CCC website is www.cameratacino.com and follow us on our social media, which are LinkedIn and, and, and others. Uh, thank you all. Alessio, back to you and wish you all a good informative seminar. Thank you, Vincenzo. So now, without further ado, um, I would like to introduce the speakers. Um, first speaker, Mr. Valentino Lucini, who is a lawyer at Wanzin and GH Law Firm based in Guangzhou, right? Or, or yes, <laughs> sorry. So, so yeah, yes, Valentino sir. is an Italian and, and Spanish lawyer working for this very renowned Chinese law firm for almost 10 years. Uh, he's uh, specialized in cybersecurity, TMT, technology transfer, and all these technology uh, sectors. And uh, um, he works with many um, cross-border, many cross-border cases uh, in Europe, Italy, uh, Spain, but also, and of course, China. Uh, he's also an arbitrator at the Hainan Arbitration Court. Um, and also uh, participates in many of these um, committees and, and platforms for um, uh, in, in this sector. Um, thank you for being with us, Valentino, today. Second speaker is Mr. Simone Ciampi, who is the general manager of Exprivia China, um, Exprivia IT Solutions Shanghai. Simone is based in Shanghai and has been living uh, there in China for, for more than 10 years. And he has a very rich experience in the IT sector. Exprivia IT Solutions um, is a leading Italian company in the ICT market and technology partner for um, uh, European, Italian, European companies in China, specializing in IT infrastructure, cloud solutions, and so on. Maybe I'll, I'll leave a more detail and cooler introduction to, to, to you. <laughs> so thank you as well, Simone, for being with us today. And um, yeah, the floor is yours, I guess. I see one hand raised, but maybe um, we, can, we can wait a little bit. We, we can start the presentation first. So I'll stop sharing my screen and you can share yours. All right, thank you so much, Alessio. Thank you so much, Vincenzo. Very nice presentation. I'm very shy every time people speak about my achievements, so uh, it's always strange to me when people address all the things I've done. In any case, let me share my slide a bit bigger so you guys can see it clearly. And uh, well, uh, I don't want to start again with what I've done, but I just want to show you this slide so you can see my WeChat here. 
because I know that today we unfortunately don't have a, a chat function open. So if you have questions, you can just raise your hand. We try to give you the floor. Or if you're shy and you believe maybe that your questions, uh, we are not certain about your questions, you can just add my WeChat or send me an email. Please don't shy to ask questions. There are no stupid questions, okay? So don't worry about that. Please, uh, let's start communicating about this stuff. Uh, the topic today is actually about data compliance in China for my hand. And the reason why uh, me and Simone thought of starting those kind of seminars is because we figured it out the lawyers and IT and also company, we sometimes don't speak the same language. What do I mean about that is that uh, when I'm uh, called by clients uh, to speak about data compliance and maybe an IT guy is involved, I usually don't understand what they're talking about when it comes to security, when it comes to internet connection and whatnot. So the best is actually to get it together and to try to have a common language, common knowledge, so we can actually overcome the issues, right? So th that's also why the main topics of today are three. We have a legal landscape. Well, I'm going to introduce uh, the three major law in China. On the second point, I will give the floor to Simone, which will explain to you guys some more technicality or technical uh, instrument you can use to make your system more compliant with the Chinese law. It may be safer. And the later we take the floor back, which I will provide a summary of steps you should take for cybersecurity and data compliance. And we will go on with a few suggestions and we will answer the model questions we received from Alessio a few weeks ago. Uh, first of all, we'd like to say that um, security when it comes to IT infrastructure and compliance, they're not the same thing, right? Because when it comes to compliance, compliance is the very basic step in order to have a system secure. But if you just follow compliance, does not mean that your IT structure, your web application, for example, your website or your e-commerce platform is secure from attacks, okay? Those are different things. In fact, most of the attacks on big company, you know, were done when those companies were fully compliant, okay? We're following the law because the law provides some basic rules, but the hackers are smart, so with one step ahead, if they miss further step to contain those attacks. We will also check later uh, what things we're supposed to do to contain them. But let's start from legal compliance. As you may know, we have three major law now fully effective in China. The first of which, uh, well, well, this is uh, the first of which is cybersecurity law, which was, I think, enacted in 2017, data security law, which was effective the last September and personal information protection law is the most recent. It is dated on November, so effective for November, right? So uh, first, let me say that China is not reinventing the wheel. What do I mean about that is that a lot of those principles that you see right now, they're nothing new. Even related to privacy protection and whatnot, all those kind of things are things that we saw abroad for many, many years. I mean, data breaches is not something happening since three days ago, right? It's something that happened 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and whatnot. And uh, when it comes to privacy and personal information protection, in Europe, for example, we have a directive in 1995, they already set the floor for it, right? So because those are new, not new things, and the fact that you're hearing maybe just right now, it may be a problem. It means you are not paying enough attention of the data compliance. And uh, if you think what I'm explaining is very overwhelming, very welcome to hire a lawyer that has the same hire style that you can see like your lawyer, very stressed to follow all those changes. So first thing, cybersecurity law, right? You may have heard about it and you say, okay, what's that? Uh, basically this law, it's a kind of framework law that applies to individual entity in the PRC that they have access to internet. Okay, so if you are in China, in the border, you have a company, you have servers and stuff, you're supposed to follow the cyber security law. It does have some extraterritorial reach, but it's more limited with respect to the other two law we will see later, right? And who should follow? I, I mentioned that it's individual entity, but it's every individual, any entity should follow this. Well, in fact, the cybersecurity law provides us three main subjects to the law. 
The first one, which is critical information infrastructure operator, CIO, which is usually company that are pretty big, maybe state-owned enterprise, which are in the business of energy, transportation, water, right, finance, public service, all those kind of things, they have a very huge impact uh, on the population, right? If you are a small company, even though you make billions of RMB, you might not be considered a CIO if you don't have a big impact on the population. So it's not doesn't really matter your revenue. What matters is the impact on the nation uh, and on the infrastructure at war. So uh, in case there is a problem with the CIO, you can understand that this will endanger national security, right? Uh, we can give you a very uh, simple analogy. Uh, now that in Europe, we have this issue with the Ukraine war and Russia, the fact that Russian uh, may cut uh, the energy supply for gas could be a problem for Europe, right? And for everybody else that is actually uh, buying uh, this energy from them. And this is a very similar thing. So if one company in China handled the water supply of a city or a district, that this problem may have a very big impact to the city, right? The second subject, the network cooperator. Network cooperator has a very broad definition because it's any entity that owns a manager network. Uh, if you think about a network, it could be just a two computer connect to the internet or connect to each other, right? That's created already a network. So if you have computer, you manage computers uh, in China, you could be a uh, network operator. So you will have certain obligations. And the third kind is provider network products or service. It means are all those kind of company that produce products that will be used by the NO network operator or by the CIO. Is the example. Asus selling you router is considered a provider of network products, right? Or uh, whatever uh, service, uh, for example, ISP, China Telecom, China Bike could be also considered as a uh, service provider for network in addition of being a CIO, right? So the third, the third uh, subject is the one that provides products. So we have a general obligation, which all three categories should follow through. And basically it is just kind of like uh, give you a kind of flavor of what this law uh, is asking uh, those subject to follow. And the first one is you need to have an internal security management rules and an operational procedure. Why? Because if a problem happened on your network and you don't have a procedure, okay, you don't know what to do. And the longer you don't know what to do, the bigger, the greater the damages, right? And in this regard, uh, what I would like to suggest to you guys is to have these internal security management rules as brief as possible, because if you have a data breach or if you have an issue, having a manual of 100 pages makes some sense. The time you go through 100 pages, you already spend three months trying to understand what happened and the damage will be greater. So usually when it comes to cybersecurity compliance, I tell my client, okay, you can make a management rules of, I don't know, encyclopedia, 100 volumes, but please try to make a one-pager thing, one-pager thing, which if there is a problem, anybody can read it, follow through it, try to solve the issue. Uh, this is something that we learned uh, also at Stanford University before, in which Stanford University provided a tablet for uh, students, which show that in case of breach, what they're going to do. That's an amazing thing, one-pager thing. Second point, you need to identify person in charge of cybersecurity means you need to have somebody in your company that if you manage a network, knows what's happening, okay? Uh, it can be the IT guy, it can be even a vendor, but you need to have somebody to refer it to. And of course, you need to implement technical measure for those kind of things, Simone can help you out. For example, company should have antivirus, you should have a firewall, all those kind of instruments. If you don't have, you're gonna face uh, a lot of trouble, right? And of course, it's not just a measure to prevent issue, it's also measure to monitor and record the status of the network. This is like called the total uh, paradox in which people are very strong on the outside and they have the greatest antivirus and firewall, but when somebody's in, they don't have nothing to monitor what's happening inside the uh, uh, IT infrastructure and the hacker can just you know escalate the credential becoming a root uh, it's called a root credential which can do anything he wants with a computer it can basically 
do as you wish. You can download files, you can see your trade secret and whatnot, right? And you're supposed to keep those kind of monitoring tool for six months. Um, the reason why six months, uh, I think, is because uh, usually company are pretty slow to understand an attack happen. Hacker are very fast to come in, but company usually spend weeks before to know there was a leak, there was somebody in the network. And for this reason, it's best to have a longer, uh, let's go log, uh, so we can see really if something happened and when it happened, right? Uh, and so it is provided by the law of six months. Uh, the other point is you need to uh, create a kind of category of data. So if your data are important, I will explain to you later. And maybe later I will also show you what we have done for a client about uh, data mapping. So basically you need to know what data you receive, what do you do with data, if this data is important, is critical or not. And uh, you need to have this uh, until a point of redundancy. Uh, keep in mind point of redundancy uh, because uh, you need to uh, demonstrate how the data is collected until the data is destroyed, if it's destroyed, if it's uh, personal information, for example. So this data redundancy is something a lot of company uh, overlook. They believe, okay, I know that this is important data, but I don't tell you where it's stored, where it's transferred, and maybe if I should destroy it because I don't need it anymore. So uh, point of redundancy is really critical. And of course, you need to backup, encrypt all important data, even though important data is defined by other draft. Uh, backup is important because in case you got a ransomware, Simone, we make you an example. Uh, not having the backup means you are victim of the ransomware, let's say, hacker uh, team. And if you don't pay, you're going to lose all your data. But if you have a backup, you simply can simply like, I don't care that you encrypted my data. I have a backup. Uh, do as you wish. This is something, an option you have to uh, be back in uh, operations. And uh, make an uh, emergency response plan. This is pretty clear. So in case you are a network operator, so you are not the big guy, you have other, um, other obligation, especially if you are uh, providing certain internet-related services. For example, you allow users to post on a, I don't know, on a blog or a social network or not. So in this case, you need to oversee, oversee what uh, the user are actually disseminating. So if they're disseminating information against uh, the Chinese uh, government or they're saying something that can create some trouble, uh, you need to oversee that and you could bear liability. So when you uh, open function for people on your web application to post anything, you need to be extra cautious. Okay, because people can post all crazy things when they have uh, the power to do so. And in case uh, there is a user that's transmitting something legal, you should stop them. I can make an example if uh, you know their user is using your web hosting website to actually give access to, uh, I don't know, movie uh, against the copyright. So basically infringing movies that pirate uh, movies. In this case, uh, you need to stop them because it's a violation, of course, to party rights, so you need to supervise it. And of course, you need to buy certain uh, products that are in line with uh, cyber security law. So uh, this is also very relevant. In case you are the big guy, the CIO, of course, because you're a big guy, you need to have a uh, special security management uh, structure, which you need to be bigger. You need to be uh, more concerned also about the uh, education of your employee because I think it's around 70% of attack are caused by phishing attack, uh, which is a way in which hackers uh, use social engineering uh, to convince people doing things that they usually don't do it. I, I could have a video maybe where I show you later, how can I do a social engineering attack in three minutes, but uh, I will spare you for now. And just make sure that your employee knows they don't have to click the wrong email if they see that the subject or the attachment is suspicious, always have the IT guy supervising things that look suspicious. If you don't train the employee, the employee will open the wrong worm or the wrong virus and the attacker will just breach your system, okay? You need to have a, a recovery system. Of course, if there is a problem, you need to solve this and emergency response. So 
When it comes to extraterritoriality, the cybersecurity law, as I mentioned, is not so overreaching like the other two. It just said, if you are outside China, and in theory, you should not apply this law in the very first place, but the fact that you are outside, you can still create damage to China, okay? You will be subject to this law. I can make an example. Somehow you are a vendor of a CIO, you are placed in, I don't know, Germany, and uh, maybe your the products you provide are bugged or the product you provide are very easy hackable, and this hackable system, you do not make the Chinese buyer aware of this, and you create a disaster, a chain effect. Uh, you could be subject to this. Like, say, okay, this is your fault because uh, you sell things to what you know is the CIO in China. You should have an extra uh, a cautious behavior on this. Okay. So, uh, another very important thing is the scare a lot of people is the fact that you need to store uh, data if you are CIO uh, in China, especially personal information and important data. But in fact, if you look at the cybersecurity law, data security law and uh, PIPL, which is the one about personal information, uh, to me, it seems like you basically need to store every data in China because for any transfer whatsoever, you need a uh, kind of approval by the authority. So, and even though a company, they may collect data directly abroad, so they could fall under uh, the so-called international transfer rules based on a recent draft by the TC260 that was issued, I think, a couple of weeks ago. It was a guideline regarding the certification, obtaining a certification for export. In that provision, they say they also company that collect data directly from outside they need to actually go through the international transfer. Without international transfer approval, you should not do that. You should not collect it. Just to give you an example, I'm an Italian platform, right? Chinese people just directly register on my platform. I have nothing in China, and I have data of Chinese people on my Italian platform. Uh, that might be considered as me collecting data of Chinese people, or uh, let's call it like uh, uh, person in the territory of China, not only Chinese people, will be also foreigners in China. And under their circumstances, if we follow this draft, uh, uh, I should do international transfer approval, which is uh, pretty severe. It's actually very different from the GDPR. Go down to the data security law. Now you understand the framework. Let's go down to the data security law and the data security law differently from the cyber security law uh, as a very, uh, extensive or rich, also outside the territory. Also in this case though, in case the data processing uh, can bring some damage to the national security. So the data security law, as the name said, is uh, regarding any kind of data that could endanger the national security of China. So it's not really related to people. And regards uh, three kinds of data, which are core uh, general data, they have important data and core data. They have this classification, right? So uh, the core data are the data important for the states, but we will see later. Uh, the very interesting things that the DSL uh, data security law brought in is the multi-level protection system. It's called MLPS at national level. What is this MLPS? You may have heard many times. It's a process of which uh, you are granted a kind of grade one to five, right? Depending on the risk associated to the processing of data, okay? It starts with a self-evaluation. If you are, your data do not endanger so much people, you can be level one. If you go from level two to five, which is the greatest level, Okay, you need to go through an assessment by an authority, and this authority will give you guidelines that will tell you, okay, you need to buy this kind of product to make your network more secure. You need to use this kind of VPN, and so not. So from two to five, you will have much more obligations, much more even cost, because the, for the level two up, it will cost 20,000, I think, US dollar up, just to do this, which is a lot of money, right? And uh, MLPS actually is a series of, uh, how to call it, standards, I think. It's a series of standards, not just one piece of uh, law unified. Plus you have one that is already still in draft, 
which is a pretty complicated piece of uh, legislation per se. But let's see what you're supposed to do based on the DSL. Uh, as the cybersecurity law, you need to have a management system. Uh, if you don't have, and by mean you don't have, means that if anytime somebody come to your company in China and they ask you, do you have anything about cybersecurity? And you don't come out with a piece of document, they believe you are not compliant. So you need to have something in which you explain the data processing you're doing and how you're doing to keep it safe. You need to do education for your staff and training, of course, and you need to uh, adopt a technical measure, okay? Also here, you need to appoint a person and you need to monitor the risk, okay? Basically, it's very similar to the cybersecurity law. In case you need to transfer data based on the uh, DSL, if you are the CIO, the one I mentioned before, you need to follow the cybersecurity law. If you are not the CEO, so you are a smaller one, there are uh, other determination by the Cyberspace Administration of China that we will see just next uh, after these slides, I will show. So there is a draft that I mentioned to you coming out a few weeks ago, if I'm not wrong. It's on data security management regulations. And um, this mention about the general data, what is the general data is the one that not belongs to the other two category. It's like a catch-all uh, catch um, classification that in case is no core data, it's not important data, it falls under this. Core data, even though I put it second, is supposed to be the more severe, the more important data you have because are related to national security, okay? A lifeline of national economy, okay? it should receive the highest degree of protection. We don't have a very super specific classification for this, but you can think about something more than important data that we have here, okay? Sorry, let me move these things down. Okay, the important data that we have here. The important data, which is the one that will affect that most of company here in China, is the one that may endanger national security or public interest if temper destroy it. We have some example, and uh, some of them are about the government affair data, work secrets, intelligence data, law enforcement, judicial data that should not leaked. Export control data means all kinds of data that are subject to export control. We know that China, when it was doing the trade war with Trump, they actually issue export control rules, which you need to take care of as well. And data related to core technology, like speaking about uh, uh, AI or all those kind of things, right? And you can see this classification, I'm not going through each one of them. You can understand whether your company can fall in one of these uh, category. Of course, knowing for certain if you are or not under this, you may need a consultant. It could be a lawyer or it could be somebody else that provide consultancy. I know that also the big fours, uh, I think EY and PwC and all, all of them, they also have some kind of cybersecurity department as well, also lawyers. I think I saw some of our friends lawyers also connected to this conference here. Uh, all of them, they can help you through this classification process which is really important. You need to know what kind of data you're processing because based on the data you're processing, you have obligations, right? And just to give you an example, that if you process important data, you need to pass through the MLPS level three, the one I mentioned to you, which is a bit higher than the one you can self-assess. A means involving a third party company coming and checking this for you, right? spending money and even reassess your uh, IT structure, right? And of course, uh, here I mentioned the uh, export of this data that I will give you more detail later on. Huh? We have in the, uh, answering the questions, the model question, we have the export, uh, how to export those data, don't worry. Going back to the third law, I know you guys are all tired of listening to all those laws, the third law, the most recent APIPL, it's about personal information, not about business information. It's like a kind of GDPR law. And uh, because uh, personal information, uh, when you apply the APIPL, you don't really need to mind uh, uh, corporate information like company name, 
VAT numbers of a company, et cetera. So if your business, if you run a business which is B2B in theory, and you don't collect personal information about the managers of your clients, uh, it would be probably likely that your PIPL will apply only in regard of your Chinese staff, people here, your employees, and not for your clients. Because of course, if you don't collect personal information of your clients, the PIPL won't apply. Uh, the PIPL has the most extraterritorial reach of the other two law. The territorial reach is very easy. You have a company here, you handle personal information, means information of a natural person, PIPL apply. So you have a Wufi, you have uh, even a Chinese company, it doesn't really matter if you're foreigners or 100% Chinese capital, you apply the PIPL, right? If you're outside, you have nothing to do with China, but the only things you do is sell to China because China is a very big market and having 1.5 billion potential clients, it's pretty nice for everybody, right? And in that case, uh, you will have extraterritorial extra reach of the PIPL. It means that if you have foreign company like in Italy, e-commerce platform serving Chinese, with a Chinese version of the website, you need to follow the PIPL. Even though in China you have nothing, and the PIPL, something I didn't write here, but I'm gonna mention, so you can pay attention, is the fact that under this circumstance, the Chinese legislator asks you to appoint, okay, a person here in China, so you need to have a kind of representative here in China, or establish a special babel, like open a company or something that will represent you. Because if you are abroad and you processing data of Chinese citizen or foreigners in China, okay? Chinese government had no way to talk to you because you are outside the territory, right? So they need you to appoint somebody here. This is exactly the same that the GDPR did. So if you look this as reverse, Chinese company offering service to Italian company without anything there, they also need to establish a, a representative in, in Italy, for example. So they use the same principle also in the PIPL and extraterritorial extra reach is also for analysis assessment of natural person behavior. Classic example, many marketing platform, broker or code, uh, what they do, they create model based on behavior. So they can sell to companies so the company can have target advertisement, right? In order to do those models, they need to process a lot of amount of data usually you, by using machine learning system uh, to understand how these consumer behave. And if they collect those data by running a kind of like surveys or whatever things in China, they also subject to the PIPL. Huh? Uh, what principle you need to follow for the PIPL? Process data or personal or, or individuals or personal information need to be legal, means you need to have a legal basis and you need to follow the law. I will explain to you which are the legal basis uh, very soon. You need to be clear, a reasonable purpose means before you collect, you need to know the reason why you're doing this. So I'm collecting your data because I'm selling you goods. And because I need your address, you need to collect the goods. I can process your name and address. But the next principle is the minimum necessity. It means I can just process the data that are required for the purpose I fixed upon. So. Back to the example, I need to sell you things. There is no reason for me to have your sexual orientation because I'm gonna deliver you, I don't know, a car, right? This information goes beyond the minimum purpose. You should not collect it. You need to do it in transparent way, it means you need to notify the individual you're collecting the data, what you're gonna do, when you're gonna destroy it. You need to be accurate, means you need to allow them system to fix the information if they're not precise. You need to be accountable, means uh, not only taking responsibility for the things you have done, but also proving that you are compliant. Uh, accountable means that when the authority come, I say, are you compliant with the BIPL? You cannot answer, I did not have data breach, I don't answer. Not answering is not the solution. You need to show that you are compliant. So you need to show maybe privacy policy and what do you do with the data and provide data security, of course. The six legal basis, as I mentioned, uh, data processing have to be legal. And what are the six legal basis? 
The first one is consent. If the subject of the processing agreed with you, go for it. You can process the data. Of course, in the limits of the purpose, you inform the guy. So you say, oh, I will do this. Do you agree? Yes, you can do it. Not beyond that, okay? Perform a contract. If I need to perform a contract, I don't need the consent. Okay, so the other one exclude the consent, right? Because the consent is one. Now we have the second one is contract. So if you need to perform a contract, I don't need your consent because the moment you sign a contract, you are expecting me to process certain data, right? Think about how absurd it would be if in order for me to perform a delivery of goods to you, I need to ask your consent to use your address. The fact that you sign a contract to receive goods, you expect me to know your address, right? Uh, third one is perform a legal obligation. Think about if you need to sue somebody and in order to sue them, you need the ID and you go to the somebody and say, hey, sorry, do you give me the consent to use your ID so I can sue you? Right, it makes some sense, right? So necessity to perform a legal obligation, legal duty, in this case, you're suing this person, you can just, um, and use the information you have if you have the ID, so you can just go for it. Or for example, you need to pay taxes, it's the same principle. Uh, public health, COVID, we know this principle, if you, there is a COVID situation or public health response, basically uh, we are not looking for consent for each one of the people, but we can overcome this limit. And also for individual's life, like somebody who's dying, uh, the hospital maybe uh, cannot ask in consent to process the name because the person doesn't respond. So in this case, in order to save his life, maybe they don't need the consent at first and they can at least save it first, right? News, of course, uh, newspaper can basically do almost what they want. In America, they have the first amendment, which allowed them extreme superpower. And the last one is the information is already disclosed. Like if I publish uh, some information online already, under certain circumstances, people seeing this could use it in a way, but this is a very complex principle. Let's not get stuck here. Uh, okay, we know what's the, uh, our situation there. So what's the rights of the data subject? What the data subject that uh, uh, provide us information uh, have right to, what they can do? Of course, right to be informed. They have right to know what I'm doing with the data. They have right to say, no, I don't want you to process my data. They have right to check and ask you, hey, can you let me know what data do you have? And you need to tell them, I have this data of you. After, of course, you confirm their identity. Right to change the data if it's wrong. Like if you misspell my name, I can tell you, hey, can you change this data? And I have their right to ask, how do you process the data? Okay, this could be a problem in case you do some kind of like uh, machine learning or AI processing, because most of the time people don't even understand how the computer really came out with some model. So really explain how the data is processed under those circumstances. It's very complicated. In Europe, we have also some problem. And when I transfer information, transfer information, uh, it's a big trouble. So the guy need to know that you're transferring, the person need to know you're transferring personal information. And this brings us to a very hot topic, international transfer of personal information, right? You can do it only if, under one of the three points on top, okay? The, the first one is a security assessment by the Chinese government, it's called the CAC, is the Cyberspace Administration of China. Big name to say is the authority in charge of the cyberspace, okay? So if you reach a certain threshold, you should apply for them. If they approve, you can transfer. You cannot first transfer, transfer it for a later ask, okay? Problem is for this point number one, implementation rules are not out yet. Uh, there is a draft which sets certain threshold, uh, but until we have a final uh, rule, we cannot really do it, right? The second point is obtain a certification, may, means that the Chinese government will authorize certain agency to do inspection on their behalf, so which could be faster, right? But also in this case, missing implementation rule, there is a draft, very recent, and uh, but we're still waiting for the final version. The third one, which is the one that everybody would love to see is, okay, I don't care about uh, checking with the government. I do by myself an agreement with the recipient of my data. And I say, I've assumed all liability 
or we both assume reliability. So the subject of the data, if he wants, he can sue us very easily, right? So and this is done usually with standard contractual clauses, which is supposed to be issued like a standard contract issued by the government as well, but the government did not issue yet. Uh, recent news told us that I have more than 3,000 draft thinking through the Bureau, but no publication yet, so we need to wait. Uh, same similar process is done in the GDPR, in which we have a standard contractual clause issued by the Commission of the European Union. La last one, I think it was, uh, it was June 2021. So in Europe, we have a similar system. So if you are uh, a company working uh, in Europe, you already know what I'm talking about. In addition to have one of those uh, elements, you need also to have a separate consent from the individual if consent is the legal basis, of course. So in this case, you need to tell the, the employee, for example, I'm transferring the data to the mother company. Do you agree? And he agree or not. So you need to notify the subject and you need to do a self-assessment. In this self-assessment, uh, very briefly, you need to you need to say, okay, I'm doing this for this reason. There are or there are not risk for the transfer. I'm to keep taking this measure. And you need to keep this assessment. Now, I will pass the ball to Simone. I hope he's not sleeping over my very boring introduction. I'm here. I'm here. Ah, you 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 there, right? Okay. I stop my my screen. Please go ahead. Good. Okay, um, I mean, uh, thanks to the Use Me Center and Lesio, CICC, and Vincenzo for organizing the, the event and the webinar, Valentino for joining it with me and all of you for attending. Uh, here you have my QR code uh, on WeChat for uh, whatever question you may have, uh, even after the, the webinar, feel free to get in touch uh, uh, with me. Um, after the, the presentation done by uh, Valentino, I think we have a very clear, I mean, very well understanding of the three laws. And of course, we are now uh, getting more and more familiar with all these kind of words of so personal data, data security, computer security, information security, and so on. It's something that, uh, sorry, guys. And uh, it's something that step by step, it's uh, uh, really uh, getting uh, more popular also in China, uh, not only because of these three laws, but also because of the uh, more and more uh, uh, virus attack, ransomware attack that are affecting also Chinese company or foreign companies in China. Um, what is the impact? Simone, of... sorry, sorry for the interruption. Uh, maybe, maybe you want to turn a video on, maybe it would be uh, I, I would like, but uh, actually, okay. I'm saying that the, 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 no, the connection is not stable, so that's why I keep it off, uh, because right. uh, otherwise I'm, I'm worried that then the connection will not be stable. Um, we, we can try if you want, but um, I, I'm not it's sure. Fine, it's fine, it's fine. Don't worry. Okay, don't worry. okay, good. Uh, sorry about that, but actually I got a few messages when Valentino was talking, saying that my connection is not stable, so that's why I, I, I prefer to go without screen. Um, so what is the impact of the, of the cyber, secu uh, cyber security and IT structure? So, I mean, of course, it would be easier if we, I can just follow what the, the three laws uh, mention about the uh, IT compliances or the IT structure compliances. But unfortunately, uh, the three laws includes only general information and recommendation, but no specific requirements or well-known best practices to follow. Uh, what we have been doing is to study the three laws, uh, to, I mean, also with the help of Valentino and his team, in order to, um, let's say, uh, find some uh, uh, general uh, requirements that companies should start to consider. In order to do this, we need to uh, talk about the multi-level protection scheme that Valentino has already mentioned, data localization and centralization that is referring to data security law, uh, privacy or personal information referring to PIPL. And then we have also a mention of uh, uh, the ICP filing, which is internet content provider. 
let's go through. I prepare. I mean, of course, this is the, the, the first one. It is a multi level protection scheme. Just a reminder, Valentino mentioned it is a China national cybersecurity system. And uh, uh, more or less, it's uh, uh, affecting all uh, companies uh, having and relying on internet and network in China. So, means all the companies, so which has uh, network infrastructure, critical information systems, uh, and whatever. Um, so basically, it's really affecting all the companies. The grading has already been mentioned to by Valentino uh, before. Here is just uh, to recall it. Um, in order, so what what should I follow? So now I have prepared a few list of, uh, let's say, um, suggestion that we have uh, we have studied and prepared for you. Uh, it's really a list in order to go through. But whatever, uh, if you need, if you have any question, feel free to 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 raise your hands, ask or stop me. So the first one is to designate a responsible person in charge of cybersecurity. Uh, this can be internal or external, can be the guy in charge of IT, can be another guy, uh, but this is very important in order to uh, have a designated guy uh, in charge to study and to keep uh, the company, uh, uh, let's say, uh, following the, the, the most updated role, laws and regulation. The second one, which is uh, uh, purchase only products available on Chinese market with CCC certification. And this is um, um, important, especially for IT security devices, networks, networking these devices like firewall switches and also servers. Uh, this is something that I, I mean, I spent a lot of time in China and time by time, this is a trend that come back. So saying that, okay, I have devices from the headquarter. Can I send it to China? Uh, maybe I'm, I'm dismissing it in uh, Italy or in Europe, but maybe you can use it in China. Yes, you can send it to China, but they're not certified, so it's not legal. So you need to buy devices in China. The third one, which is very important, is to localize in China as many services and devices as possible. So not only servers, but also email, website, ERP, and so on. This sometimes is very um easy like for example to have a server located in uh, in china now may, more and more companies are doing this uh email system uh, is getting more popular more and more popular to get it localized in china especially using uh in, in platform uh, which are well known like microsoft or uh, alibaba uh, it's a little bit more tricky about the erp or crm because usually it's something that the headquarters want to keep uh, centralizing their IT structures. And so on this side, we really need to pay attention. Uh, of course, the best advice is to have to localize it in China in terms of uh, uh, deployment, server, and uh, applications. But if the headquarters really want to keep it in uh, their, uh, their own IT structure, uh, of course, here an assessment done by a legal and by an IT company is needed in order to understand what data are transferred abroad and uh, uh, if it's possible and how it's possible to do, like Valentino mentioned, mentioned before. And the fourth one is very, very, very important. So it's enhanced the security level of the IT devices. And here I'm going to be a bit technical, but I'm talking about UTM bundle for firewalls. Uh, which uh, uh, are very, very important to keep your networking uh, uh, safe, antiviruses, not only for server, but even, I mean, also for uh, PCs, because it's from where uh, the virus attacks usually comes from. So those have to be, of course, uh, deployed, but also to be uh, yearly renewed, usually UTM bundles, antiviruses, they release uh, yearly up updates, and this is important to, to, to do it uh, year by year. So to put it on the budget, because it can really help uh, the, the, to improve and to increase the security level of the, of the company. Uh, of course, software uh, need to be uh, bought and deployed uh, with official licenses. Now it's more and more difficult to, to, to use, uh, I mean, unlicensed or fake licenses, but anyway, uh, this is, of course, it's, uh, it's uh, always important to, to remind. And then uh, we go to the backup strategies, these and recovery plans. I mean, this is uh, a key part uh, of the uh, MLPS 
suggestions and this is also very important to protect your companies from uh, from a ransomware attack or from uh, um, let's say attacks from uh, from hackers backup strategies should be usually uh, done in an online and offline mode that means something uh, online like uh, uh, i mean backup done on uh, on on the network so on nas or on a different server uh, which can uh, allow you to have a fast recovery in case of uh, a small issue a file loss or whatever and then an offline backup. So it means that something which is completely disconnected from the network that you do once, like uh, uh, we were using before the, the tape drives. So the, the kind of uh, backup that you do it once, you take out the tape from the device, you store it in your drawers, or you store, you store it in, in the safe, uh, and you take it, you, you, you are going to use it only if it's a major problem or a disaster happened, like a virus attack. So the combination and the strategy that should be applied is a mix between online and, back and offline backup in order to keep your company uh, safe. Multi-factor authentication is something which is always uh, uh, important and companies are really uh, starting to use more and more. Of course, this is affecting a bit the operativity of the end of the user is a bit more frustrating every time to, to do a, maybe a double authentication, but this is really important to keep your uh, IT environment safe. Uh, protection and encryption software. This is uh, uh, something that is really not uh, uh, well known among companies uh, or well, I mean, at least not really uh, used at the moment as software that are, I mean, actually uh, protect and encrypt your file uh, so in case someone try to 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 get into your uh, network try to to keep your to store your data uh, of course they, they they really cannot because they, your data or encrypted or protected uh, also for these specific kind of softwares there are many uh, they are, i mean the more you encrypt the more you protect uh, of course the 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 more the more the more complicated is the management of the operativity of the of the company of the of the employees uh, because of course maybe to send an email they need first to decrypt the, the file and then to make an, to, to to attach it to the mail but it's really a good help for the security of the uh, uh, let's say of the of the company and then uh, the, the last two are what the one is to create and maintain a, an admin list which on which we are going to record uh, everything related to to it information so services deployed password backup information etc and this is especially important in case of a problem in case of something happen because you need to have a fast response and so only if you have everything uh storing can kept on an admin list or uh, it, it can be easily easily done and then last but not least it's a, a training for the employees of course uh, in order to uh, teach them on uh, what to do how to do uh, remember them to turn off the pc at the end of the day uh, reminding them to do not click on mail on website which they don't know the uh, the if they are authentic or not and so on. I mean, actually, if you keep the employees updated, and now there are many, many ways you can create, uh, let's say, fake phishing email in order to see uh, if the user are uh, clicking on it by mistake or not, if they are paying attention to those kind of messages, uh, you can, uh, uh, of course, do more and more tests uh, in order to stress uh, your uh, IT structure to see if it's uh, uh, really well protected or not, and this can help as well uh, to, to keep your company safe. Many of these are suggestions included in the multi-level protection scheme, but they are very useful as well to protect your company from uh, uh, virus attack. Uh, this has already been mentioned uh, by Valentino uh, before, and uh, then we go to data localization and centralization. These are just uh, some uh, uh, definition already mentioned by Valentino. So in case if you have any question, we, co we can uh, go deeper uh, later with questions. Uh, and maybe Valentino or me, we can, uh, we can specify something later. Um, 
but let's go to the other the, the, the other list that they have prepared for you so i mean according to the data localization and centralization what should i do um, one important point is to have to implement and to have one centralized it system or platform uh, on which you um, you manage and you implement all your um, software and systems and uh, um, data uh, that you have inside your company. I mean, maybe you have different offices in China, maybe different office, or maybe people working by remote. So, I mean, actually, the good suggestion that we can give to you is to keep the system centralized in the main headquarters of your. Uh, China uh, activity and from there deploy the services to the other to the other office. This will help you to increase the security level of the of the of the I, the data and of course also to in easily management of uh, uh, let's say all the uh, password, all the backups, all the information that you need to keep as safe as possible. Then the other one is to conduct a data localization analysis. Because especially if you are using a cloud system or a mix of uh, uh, internal and external services, uh, sometimes it's very difficult to know where the data are localized. And so it's very, very easy that you may have uh, a, a data transfer abroad, which you don't know. And in case of a, a, a check by the authorities, you can, you can have trouble for, for that. So it's always good that there are software doing this. A company specializing on this, analyzing, doing a very good mapping of your data, where are, where are located, where are stored, where are you utilized, who is going to access to those data. And uh, uh, of course, so with that kind of analysis, you can have uh, a data classification and uh, grading helping you to better manage your, your, your data. Um, dedicated protection system, uh, this is something that we mentioned before, but it's always uh, uh, useful uh, to mention it again. And then uh, uh, you need to have rules to collect and to manage data, because what happened here is that maybe you set some, uh, some rules at the beginning, you, you have uh, a file sharing file, you, have, uh, you, you start to record some uh, uh, information, some password, and then you forget to uh, keep changing the password you don't uh, maybe people that are uh, leaving the company they are still uh, maybe able to 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 access somehow the your company information so this it's always useful to keep uh, rules to collect the rules to manage the data in a professional way and uh, to time by time change the password update the information of your IT structure in order to be ready to be uh, let's say uh to to have a fast reaction in case of any problem data risk assessment or vulnerability assessment this is very very um getting very very popular especially with the increase of the um uh, ransomware attack and those kind of assessment they are going to stress to make some uh, uh deep check and uh, find the vulnerability of uh, your network your uh servers your pc and to see that actually usually uh, can be done by specific software and by uh, cyber security experts so they uh, they scan basically the whole network the, the the whole server structure they scan the pc or maybe they do they they, they do a random test on few pc and they basically give you a detailed report with all the uh, vulnerability they find on your system with different level uh, from high, medium, and low. And this is very helpful for the IT management and the IT manager in order to go in step by step to solve those uh, problems. And usually we suggest to run this kind of vulnerability test once every quarter because actually even if you do it once, it doesn't mean that after a few months, uh, uh, your risk level is still the same, okay? Because actually hackers are very good. Uh, they are every day trying to improve their tools to hack you. So it's always good to run this every three, four months in order to make sure that your uh, security level is still good enough. Um, of course, take enough rem the remedy measures. So of course, also here, the, uh, keep monitoring the data flows frequently. It's uh, uh, something that is uh, 
uh, of course can be done as well uh, by the, with the help of, uh, of the software, which is uh, another kind of check uh, connected with the data risk assessment. And then again, I mean, also both me and Valentino, we stress a lot on this is to keep and do a lot of training also for your staff. Uh, the last, uh, the last one. It's uh, I'm going going, going really fast on this. Uh, it's uh, privacy and uh, personal information protection. Uh, the first one, uh, the thing I want to mention is the facial recognition, fingerprints, and CTCTV system are considered sensitive and personal information, so should be managed and protect uh, um, carefully. Um, of course, as Valentino mentioned, it's important to appoint a personal information protection officer. Can be uh, the, the same guy in charge of the same guy the, in charge also of cybersecurity. Can be a different one, uh, but it's uh, it's something that it's uh, it's a must to have. Um, plan periodical uh, personal information uh, assessment, both from a legal and IT point of view. With Valentino, we are doing a lot of this, and we are seeing that it's uh, very, very helpful also for uh, to let uh, companies really understand uh, what what is the level of risk, what is the current situation, and also to do uh, to suggest all the steps needed in order to uh, be more and more compliant. Of course, it's I mean actually. Uh, laws, laws and regulation for the moment are not well defined and so strict. So you, you have time to adjust your, your, also your IT structure to the laws, but you need to start. And so it's always good to start with uh, uh, an assessment. So you have the as is situation and the, what you should have as to be as final and uh, situation. So, I mean, you have time to, to go through it, but it's always important to start with uh, an assessment. Recovery plan, uh, uh, of course, always very, very important. Training again. And then for whatever system managing and collecting personal information, uh, you should be able to receive feedback from a user to be able to quickly locate, export, and delete every single user records. Plan a reasonable authentication uh, system to recognize the user who is uh, uh, making every single request. Um, separate sensitive personal information in different database, and then perform a data masking, uh, which is uh, especially important if you are uh, doing a cross-border data transfer. So maybe if you are transferring data abroad and you are able to do a data masking, means that you may be able to transfer only those data which are not sensitive, which are not under the PIPL. So this can help you to keep some data outside, but to be compliant uh, uh, with the law. Valentino, my, I finished with all my uh, technical and uh, boring parts. So if you want to, to going ahead i will stop my um sharing oh god thank you so much Simone. i felt asleep and um now i recover kidding i know it was a great presentation <laughs> now it was a great presentation i love it every time you speak about this i'm very fascinated so now for the one of you who are still online and willing um to see something i will show you uh first steps that should be taken okay uh when it comes to uh when it comes to data mapping. So as Simone mentioned, and I mentioned before, uh, you need to classify data, right? It's the very first step. If you don't know what data do you have, how can you assess, how can you say you're compliant or not? And um, to know what data do you have, usually you do a data mapping and data flow. Uh, both of them I will show to you, not in full, because I think uh, my client will kill me if I show you the job we provide for them against payment. I'll just give you a sneak peek of what this is about. And the first Excel that you can see here is a chart, right? And this chart uh, start, uh, it's about the HR, human resources. So people, uh, companies having Chinese or foreign employees in China, uh, how they classify the data based on the PIPL. I'm not speaking about cybersecurity law, IDSL. Huh? So you start, of course, when it comes to HR about the pre hiring phase. So before you hire people, you receive some data. And usually this data comes from the candidate, first column, from whom, is inside or outside. So it means you receive it or you transfer and goes to whom, means the employer, in this case, uh, my client, right? And later you say, okay, uh, what kind of sources? 
is the resume. A lot of people come to your company, give you the CV, it's full of the personal information. And when you collect this CV, you have an obligation towards them, okay? What kind of information does it contain? One of the jobs that we've done or uh, consultant do, or you can do yourself if you wish, is to classify. And you say, okay, we have all this personal information. It's green because it's just personal data. It's red, it is sensitive, okay? So for the people, they see red, they know that you have to be extra cautious if it's sensitive. The format, how that's been received and sent, the purpose, that all things I mentioned to you need to be listed here. And we go to the purpose, we go to the transfer, we go in the retention. So basically the whole things you do, you need to classify the whole process. I receive it, I put it there, I store it for a long. What's the reason why I store it? Did I transfer to Italy? Did I keep it here? Is the computer protected by password? Or did I lock this thing uh, inside a cabinet with a key? Those are all relevant things. They show you compliance. OK, let me not save this. And um, you know, because this is very complicated, I think what we need to do to the client, uh, uh, this is something that we have created with Simone in the time, you need to create a graphical representation. Because if you give them the Excel, they may not follow it. Even though you give the Excel, the Excel has to be, uh, it's a manual way of doing it. And they need to keep uh, updating it after you provide the first assistance. The second things that you do is called uh, ma ma mapping and flows, let's say, in which you repeat a very similar exercise in which you mention source of data, so where the data comes from, different colors, so it's easy to understand. And you see these massive things that goes back to what kind of personal information are we talking about? So we know the first and family name comes from uh, different sources. We have different color, right? And of course, gender, all those kind of things. Those are green because they're personal information as before. And they're red if they're sensitive information. We divide in this way because sensitive information need to be extra cautious. So the where they go, you need to know exactly where they're going. And the things become even more massive. I'm not sure you guys can see these massive things of lines, right? And uh, you see, what kind of documents contain those information. So you know a resume, I have the several personal information, one sensitive information. So it's not so dangerous to store this resume somewhere. Uh, if it's in paper or electronic, there's a different approach. And we go down and we can see that there are certain documents that collect a massive amount of personal, uh, sensitive personal information, like a salary list. Usually a uh, foreign company in China a foreign invested company in China, what they do, they create a salary list they send to the mother company for approval. And this salary list is full of name, ID, position, is packed with uh, personal and sensitive information. It's crazy the amount of information there are inside this document. And if this document leak can really bring damage to the people because somebody can steal, uh, steal this personal identity, okay? And of course, later we go here, we mention where the information are going, where are stored, for example, cabinet, company system, and whatnot, right? And um, in the end, uh, uh, the next step, uh, the step is actually a report. In this case, uh, we have done, it's about human resources and the content to mirror what is the PIPL, in which we say, uh, you have these things, for example, just to give you an idea, Name of clients are, are canceled, so we don't need to be worried. So we mentioned the, the application of the laws, C, uh, CLS, PIPL, if does this apply or not, and uh, very cool things. We do visit to the factory with Simone. We make our hands uh, dirty. Uh, Alessio, you tell me. Uh, yes. Yeah, I mean, it was uh, maybe a question that I had on what you have just said, but... Uh, 
uh, like in the case that are, that are subsidiary in China sends this uh, salary list to the headquarters with all the sensitive information. Mm -hmm. So thinking from like the reality of a small and medium company, what uh, should yeah. be done in this case? You mentioned in the first part of the presentation that um, there should be some security reviews from, from the cyberspace administration if it exceeds the threshold. So how do, yes. how do I know, what should you do? Like let's say a company with 10 people. Yes. Uh, if a company is small and they do not collect a lot of data, right? Uh, in theory, you just need to look at the data security law. And if this data is not important information, right? You don't need to do crazy things. It's maybe general information because important information can endanger national security, right? Uh, if it's just the people information, it's not really considered as important information entering into the category of general information, which is also personal information. So you focus on the PIPL. And when you focus on the PIPL, you have three choices, right? The CAC approval is for a number of information. If it's a lot, you need a CAC. If not, you can go through certified authority when they will be approved, okay? If you don't want to go through the certified authority, you need to do a standard contractual clause. Uh, uh, you need to make a contract with the company in Italy, the company in Germany, in which it's kind of mirroring what the GDPR also providing, saying, uh, we will take care of this data. Uh, the Chinese company will be fully liable if the Italian company does something stupid, something like that. And you pack this kind of agreement uh, and you make it available in your Chinese company in case of checking, and you inform the subject that you transfer the data to Italy. So if there is a leakage on the data in Italy or Germany, through this contract, uh, your Chinese subsidiary will be sued if uh, there are some information which are relevant, the guy can sue, of course, need to demonstrate the damages or whatnot, but this is another story. Basically, a small medium enterprise does not need to do crazy things. Okay, need to implement maybe a nine day virus on their computer, a firewall, having a backup, some minimal IT structure things. And instead of applying article, it's article 38 of PIPL, point number one and two, they just focus on the number three, the standard contractual cost. At the moment, they are not published yet. I'm not suggesting you to violate the law by transferring information uh, outside, but I do understand that a lot of people can stop it right now. And if you can stop it right now, you try to transfer just personal information in just the strict and necessary, try to avoid transfer of sensitive information, or you try to make them anonymous if you can. So you need to filter the information in a way that the things are moving out from the moment that the implementation rules are not so clear, it won't create big damage if somebody come and check it, okay? This is the, the general idea, which I suggest, I tell people, okay, I cannot suggest you to violate the law. It's, it's like a good reason myself. But what I can tell you is that if you can stop it, especially some companies that we face with Simone, they have a CRM, ERP system, they control the clients. And the CRM, maybe it's Microsoft Dynamics in Europe, okay? They bought it in Europe. So every time they insert clients' information, Chinese clients, it goes directly to the Microsoft Europe. It's not in China, right? And this is international transfer, right? It's, uh, it's happening. So in that case, uh, there is a way to filter, even though because a lot of time they don't need so many information outside, okay? So for example, what's the reason why you transfer this salary information to the mother company? It's for a budget? Do you need to divide the name of each employee or you can give them just a sum of the money they need to pay you? If you can make it anonymous, you tell them you need to pay 1 million and they pay 1 million, right? So you can adjust those kind of things. And, uh, but of course, uh, there are also, there is also mention, I don't remember, I think it's the PIPL. There is mention in one article by the end of the law, if I'm not wrong, that the uh, legislator, we also implement some rules for small companies. So there could be some rules in which you say, if you're a small company, you don't need to care about anything. In a very uh, GDPR fashion, in GDPR, there's also rules that say, if you're a small company, certain uh, reporting obligation you don't have. I think probably they could do something like that. I remember it wasn't the IPL, 
maybe somebody have a fresh mind of the legislation can uh, intervene and tell you. But uh, yes, there, there is something about that. And uh, right. but this is a report. What uh, the only things I mentioned, we go there and check, try to open, you know the the cabinet here to see if it's closed. If it's open, say ah, you see somebody can steal the documents. We check uh, also if the computer has password. We check all those kind of beautiful things. And um, this is from the practical part. I hope uh, it can be useful for you guys. Last part, uh, if we have 10 minutes, we can go through the questions. What do you think, uh, Alessio? Yeah, let's do that. Uh, again, uh, these are questions that we have collected from European companies before this webinar. So they uh, likely reflect general concerns that companies have. But of course, I would like to invite again, if there is any, any questions from the audience, unfortunately, we don't have the Q&A box for some reason today at the bottom yeah. of, the, of the Zoom, but uh, you can raise your hand and just ask the question. Let, let's, um, please don't, don't hesitate to do so. In the meantime, we can go through these questions that we received. Right. So the first interesting question was, what's the most common cybersecurity and data compliance issue the foreign company encounter in, in China? In general, uh, uh, most of companies, especially the medium, uh, small enterprise, um, they don't know how to really apply those laws. And they don't, they are not ready for cybersecurity. They don't have uh, a structure to say, okay, the IT system is like that. We have five computers, we have one server, two switches, and um, uh, they transfer data outside China uh, illegally. So they take even sometimes through WeChat or other system that just pack the Excel file without password, bam, send to uh, by WeChat somewhere in the world, uh, which is uh, people can download it, do those strange things. Um, this is very common, very common. Com uh, company more, more structures, uh, of course they have systems, but they usually mirror what they do abroad. So I think having a China compliant company is very rare. Even multinational company usually mirror, for example, United States multinational companies, they mirror what they do in the States most of the time. So if there are California company, they mirror the CPA, the CPRA. If they're European, they mirror the GDPR because they believe it's super, super strict. This is basically from my perspective. Uh, the second question is about uh, threat and vulnerability. Simone, will you, do you want to add oh, yeah, this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, actually, the, 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 the vulnerabilities uh, have been very, very, uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's difficult to answer uh, in details, but because actually, I mean, we see a lot of cases of companies with uh, a real, a really a, a still a poor IT structure. So in terms of uh, uh, backup in terms of antiviruses, in terms of, uh, um, let's say, training they provide to, to, to users. So, I mean, actually, the, 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 uh, the biggest problem usually comes from uh, uh, phishing attacks that, of course, then brings to uh, big problems to, to, for, for, the, for the destruction. But uh, for also from a company point of view, actually, uh, usually, as what I can see, still see, especially in, I mean, for small and medium enterprises, is really uh, uh, poor devices in terms of uh, uh, network. So maybe uh, firewall, firewall. Uh, maybe it's a low level or not an updated one, and they don't have UTM bundles for security bundle. Uh, antivirus is maybe the just the one from uh, comes from with Microsoft, uh, which is better than nothing, but is definitely not the one suitable to protect the PC or the server from uh, uh, hacker attack. Um, and then, of course, also the backup, because actually, if something happened, the only thing that can save the company data is the backup. So this is something that we the companies should really pay. Uh, a lot of attention. Uh, those are probably the the the, the main uh, the main uh, vulnerabilities that we can see from with our with our with I mean foreign companies, small and medium enterprises. Actually, recently in the last four months, actually we had uh, uh, four or five different clients uh, that I mean actually attacked by a, a ransomware virus, and uh, only because the backup was properly running. Uh, they have the data safe without paying money. Otherwise, of course, the company were facing uh, or a big loss in terms of data or a big loss in terms of uh, money if they were going to, to pay the ransom. 
Oh, that's great. That's great. So a uh, third question is about uh, manufacturing company activities in China and consider whether the information are important data. I think a very easy test is understanding whether the data you manage in your R&D activities may endanger national security uh, and public interest. Uh, an idea is uh, you do R&D on vaccines, on medicine, pharma, it could be important data. You do R&D on models related to financial institution, could be important data. But if you do R&D and you believe uh, those kind of R&D is just your trade secret, won't endanger national security, trade secrets are excluded by the DSL. So you don't need to uh, take care of the trade secret and share it with the Chinese government. This is pretty clear. So if something is your trade secret, you need to keep it secret. It's not, it won't be a trade secret anymore. So usually what we do, we have client understanding what really kind of information they're processing and really see whether this can uh, endanger uh, public interest or national security. Even though if, if you do R&D on e-commerce platform or people's behavior, I don't think this is really important data per se, automatically. So I think yeah, this Valentin, is uh, in fact, an This question actually came uh, mostly about transfer from... To from companies in the pharmaceutical sector doing like clinical yeah, yes. kind of studies and things like that. And yes, that's a, that could be, uh, but depends also what kind of uh, pharmaceutical you are working on it, right? Uh, but if the pharmaceutical situation is vaccination, is related to public health, uh, yes, it could be important data. And in order to transfer abroad, you need to be extra cautious. Another cautiousness, uh, which a lot of people overlooked, uh, is also related to R&D in relationship to um, artificial intelligence and algorithm. Uh, because uh, Chinese government is attracting a lot of company with subsidy to come in here and doing R&D, especially in artificial intelligence or all those kind of beautiful things. But the moment you do the R&D in China, there is an export control now in China, which stop you, regardless of what I'm talking about important data, stop you from uh, take those things and bring them out. So if happened to you to create the next TikTok, and the moment you create the next TikTok you created in China, you may have problems selling this company abroad, as we saw what was happening with Oracle in the United States. So it's not only a problem of data, is that there are a lot of export restrictions for those kind of products, which you may have problem even taking the clinical results out of China. So you need to think through whether the R&D activities really need to be done here. Okay, uh, sometimes you have to, because in order to have authorization or approval certificate, you need to go through a clinical approval here. So you must do it, but some company maybe they don't really have to. So they should consider a different strategy. Right? So, and when it comes to uh, export of this important data, I have the next slide, which is more clear. You have a two steps based on the draft, okay? The draft can be uh, something totally different tomorrow. Um, you have two steps, okay? For uh, important data and, and personal information, let's say. Uh, the first one is a self-evaluation, okay? You always start evaluating yourself the legality of what you're doing, the scope, the damage on the, let's say, the subject of the data, right? All those kind of things before you transfer. So you're gonna make a report uh, together with your account, with, with your, uh, sorry, your assistants or your lawyers, consultant and whatnot, in which you're gonna check the risk. Okay, if this uh, pharmaceutical research data leaks, Am I damaging people because there is the name of the guy with HIV, which is a, under a clinical trial? So everybody knows that this guy has a HIV. Or the data I'm transferring does not really have the name of this guy. It's anonymous. And maybe it's safer to transfer outside. It's just a clinical result. Uh, this is something also to be considered, right? And after you have done this, you have a government uh, approval. Okay, the second, second step in which uh, the first thing they check is the country. And this first point can have a very strong political flavor uh, because they look where this information go. And if the country who received those data is not really friendly, uh, it might be a problem. 
Even though the uh, legal environment could be very advanced, because of course, uh, anything related to data going to Europe, we have the golden standard. GDPR is a piece of work of art. Some, some uh, scholar do, they don't agree with me, but I love the detail they put in these things. And um, uh, I think transferring something to Europe, in theory, make it uh, safe because European system is making safer as much as possible for the data subject, okay? And then, of course, they check the security protection of the local law, okay? This is something that uh, was also raised by uh, Europe. Uh, the, uh, when was uh, the discussion about on the, um, uh, it was the privacy shield with the United States. The uh, fact that um, the FBI or the NSA could actually overcome all uh, uh, restraint in order to have access to data. It is something Europe is discussing also with them. So, and of course, they will also look at the contract you have with the recipient. This is more or less. Um, I think this is another question. I'm not sure if the last one. It's about the CIO. It's a very interesting question, actually. And then when the, when you asked me, I was like, "Wow, that's very nice indeed." Uh, because in theory, uh, it does not tell you that a foreign company can't be CIO, critical uh, information infrastructure organization. Because if you are a foreign company, you work in energy, telecom, etc. Uh, you're supposed to be, but um, in theory, in China, there is a catalog uh, called negative list, right? So in certain uh, circumstances, foreign company, in order to provide certain kind of products and service, they need to open a subsidiary here. From abroad, they can't really provide the service. I, I make an example, uh, added value service on telecom. Uh, certain of them, you cannot do it from abroad. You need to establish a company here, and in certain cases, you need to have a Chinese partner, okay? So uh, I think here the issue is more on uh, investment limitations per se. So you, if you wanna be a CIO, probably you need to open in China subsidiary because uh, the industry you work in maybe is regulated. And the moment you open in China, you are a Chinese company. So even though it's invested by uh, foreigners, it's a hundred percent Chinese uh, entity, okay? Under legislation, later the capital is another story. So I think more than this, but in any case, um, to know if you are CIO, uh, you need to inquire certain authority. And usually uh, each sector has a kind of like authority that supervise what they do. Like in the telecom industry, you have a supervising authority. And usually it's the supervising authority that tell you you are CIO and you need to comply with certain rules. So if somebody adapts, they could use uh, staff or lawyers to check with the supervisory authority of that industry, whether they uh, reach this kind of standard, okay? Maybe let me no, add something. This, this question came from um, companies, especially okay. in the environment energy sector, like monitoring yeah. the operations of certain energy production plants or things like those. Uh, say yes. I have a small monitoring device, but I collect, I monitor a lot of data. So the- Ah, right. Was an so it's not, it's not equal to be a CIO because CIO is not um, providing just collateral service or products to environment, but being like company that work on the environment per se. So like, for example, if you work in the water sector, it's more water supply than maybe water pumps, okay? Water pumps is a kind of an accessory to the water supply. So what they care is that the more that you are, because if you are providing service or products to them, you are the third category of the cybersecurity law, which is the one provided goods and service to the CIO. So you have a different uh, regulation that apply to you because you're providing a kind of device. Later, this, the number of data that you collect, okay, may bring you uh, be considered as a kind of like a massive uh, collector of data, which had different requirement. For example, uh, under the PIPL, if you collect on a massive amount of uh, personal information, you need to appoint a DPO. You must appoint a DPO, data protection officer, because you collect a massive. So if the problem is the data might not be connected to the activity that you, that you do, right? So it really comes down to know really what they're doing, what, what kind of device, if it's really so important that it's critical, okay? 
I think we need to have a different angle of this, but it would be interesting, yeah. Uh, oh my God, we have other two questions. I think we ran out of time, but maybe those questions, uh, you want me to answer or what do you think? No, I think uh, what we can do, we can share the slides um, afterwards. Yeah, we can definitely do that. And then if there that. are other questions from, from participants, uh, please feel free to contact Valentino or Simone directly. Uh, there will be their contacts in the slides. You can also ask us eventually, we will be happy to put in contact. Um, so I think I think we can end up here. Uh, maybe, maybe if you don't mind stopping your uh, sharing the screen, uh, I also have one final slide. Um, but I would like to thank you for, for the presentation. I think it was very nice. It was full of practical, um, let's say practical tips that uh, companies uh, really, really, really care about. Um, this is the QR code for a small feedback uh, questionnaire that we would really appreciate if you could feel it just, it just takes a couple of minutes. And um, there are also suggestions here for, for other uh, following uh, webinars, maybe on the same topic or other topics. So we would really appreciate if you could feel it. Um, so I think we can end up here. And uh, again, any questions, uh, contact us, contact Valentino, Simone directly. Uh, we will share the slides uh, of the speakers. We will also upload the recording of this webinar to YouTube, to our YouTube channel. And, um, and yeah, I guess we can end up here. Thank you, everybody. Have a great evening. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye.